Hello, everybody, and welcome to Wi-Fi Now TV in association with RCR Wireless News. My name is Klaus Hetting. On today's show, the world's biggest Wi-Fi hotspot network CEO of iPass, Gary Griffiths, is with us today. We'll ask him what he's going to use his 50 million Wi-Fi hotspots for. Also on the show, core network vendor, Aptilo Networks. They've been driving carrier Wi-Fi forward for more than a decade. We've got Aptilo CEO, Paul Mickelson, on the show. Join us right after this short message. Telecom Careers, the number one global telecom and wireless job board. Telecomcareers.com. With RCR Wireless News, my name is Klaus Hedding. On today's show, the world's biggest... Hello, everybody, and welcome back. The CEO of iPass, Gary Griffiths is with us today. We'll ask him what he's with his 15 years in Wi-Fi can you hear me okay in the control? Four network vendor, Aptito Network. Right, David, okay, you? so before we get our guests on board, uh, I just wanted to mention as you know, that Wi-Fi Now, the conference is coming up in Amsterdam this fall, November 17th to 19th, to be precise. And we are uh, we are delighted, of course, to have Gary, Gary Griffiths there, one of our speakers, and also Aptino Networks will be there. Also, while you... Uh, have some fun and have a break from your regular by taking Wi-Fi Now, the quiz. If you go to our Twitter handle uh, at Wi-Fi Now events, you will see uh, a link to the quiz. You can go in there, you can win a gold pass to All right, everybody, with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. His name is Gary Griffiths and he's the CEO of iPass. Gary, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Klaus. Pleasure to be here. Great to see you, Gary. And just about, uh, well, I think it was just a couple of weeks ago, Gary, iPass announced the world's biggest Wi-Fi hotspot network, 50 million hotspots, of course, in partnership with DeviceScape. Uh, and I'm gonna ask you more details about that in just a second, but maybe just for the viewers that are not familiar with, what iPass does, can you give us the, a short overview of the company? Sure, so we are a software company. We're, we're a software company that provides Wi-Fi connectivity around the world uh, as a service. So in order to do that, as you mentioned, we do have the largest international Wi-Fi hotspot uh, network. So as you say, we're building up to 50 million. Uh, a good part of that coming from the 20 million hotspots that we acquired with our partnership with DeviceGate. So 100, about 120 countries, 50 million hotspots, the idea to connect people on Wi-Fi wherever they are in the world. And, and Gary, you're, 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 much of your work thus far at iPass has been uh, targeted the enterprise market, especially, especially for travelers and so on. But I, my impression is that you're now going after a broader segment, is that correct? Yeah, it, it, it's absolutely correct. Uh, we did traditionally sell to large enterprise. Uh, on April 21st, we launched what we call iPass Unlimited. Unlimited is a 100% SaaS solution, completely hosted, and it is targeted in addition to enterprise, it's targeted for small and mid-sized businesses as well. So uh, we are going downstream. We're having uh, tremendous success with Unlimited, the uptake on a truly SaaS based uh, Wi-Fi connectivity service has been uh, has been terrific and we're very excited about that. And your partnership with DeviceScape, can you comment on that? They have a somewhat different approach of aggregating hotspot that, that, than you, you guys do. You have more of a managed service approach uh, and, and so on. Well, we do, and we, and, but we, we bring that, uh, that tremendous DeviceScape network into our managed service. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason that we can do that, given that that the, uh, the device gave Wi-Fi hotspots are free amenity hotspots is when we went to unlimited Wi-Fi with this new launch, uh, people aren't paying us by usage anymore. So they pay a single flat monthly fee and they get all the Wi-Fi that they can use. So now that I have device gate, I can just make it much more convenient for our customers because now they have another 20 million hotspots that they can get access to through iPass. 
Right, and 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 is that already active? The the you know is it actually deployed? The the, the partnership can people actually use it today? They can use it today, but uh, but very quickly. We've been uh, the the engineering teams have been working together, and we expect that integration to be done within the next thirty days or so. All right, very good. So you've been quite open, Gary. I was reading your blog about uh, uh, reinventing iPass, if you like, because there's been a change in management. Uh, can you tell something? About, tell us a little bit about why you felt that was necessary, because I know you, you've been explaining that to people. Yeah, for sure. Well, we we had uh, we we're just spending too much money. Uh, we we are a um, we're a uh, small company, and our expenses were just not proportional to our revenue and our um, the size that we were trying to achieve in terms of profitability and, and revenue growth. So we're, um, you know, we're about a $60 million company. And in order to get to profitability, which is coming very closely, we, um, we just needed to reduce some of the overhead. And of course, in a business like ours, most of the money is with senior executives and we just had more than we needed. So uh, we made some changes at the top, streamlined the business, and we're pretty pleased with the results. We have a uh, what I think is the best senior management team in, in Silicon Valley right now, and uh, we're making some great progress. So let's talk a little bit about business models because this, the, 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 the uh, shall we say, the challenge of monetizing Wi-Fi is something that I'm, I'm sure occupies your mind a lot, as it does the minds of lots of other people across this industry. What what business models do you think might come into play? And we're talking about it in your case, uh, a mobile, sorry, a Wi-Fi hotspot network of 50, 50 million hotspots, which all of a sudden has a massive scale here. Right. So you would think that other, con for example, content and service providers might be interested in getting a piece of that. Well, I think that's exactly the, the point. The larger we get, the more attractive we become to both enterprises who want to make sure that their employees are connected wherever they travel, wherever they are, whether it's at home or whether it's um, it's on the road. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, the larger we get, the more pervasive we are, the more attractive we are to partners. And we have partners, uh, in order to put 50 million hotspots around the world, we've, we've accumulated partnerships with over 160 service providers, everyone from Deutsche Telekom to British Telecom to AT&T, and of course, Devicescape and, and many others that, that mm -hmm. uh, we haven't talked about today. So um, in that sense, there, there is a very straightforward business model. Uh, I, I have contracts with all these service providers and contract with them to buy essentially Wi-Fi network capacity at a certain price, and then I resell that to our customers through that flat monthly fee that I mentioned. Now, mm -hmm. that business model works very well. As we look into the future, we see certainly other ways that Wi-Fi will be monetized. And, and I, I, I assume you're, you're gonna to want to talk here eventually about the Internet of Things, uh, because that's probably a very different business model than what right. we're doing today. If for no other reason, then, then things are not people. And so having things pay a monthly subscription rate is probably not the way that's going to work. Right, exactly. But I'm also thinking of potential partnerships with uh, companies like uh, Microsoft or Google or Netflix or Amazon or companies like that. Well, yeah, it's a very good point. We are um, we are partnered, for example, with Hewlett Packard. Uh, every every laptop and tablet that HP ships in the Asia Pacific region has iPass embedded with it. Uh, we've talked about our partnership with Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft Skype for today with, with Wi-Fi is actually powered by uh, iPass, and Microsoft has, has said publicly that Windows 10 will be powered by iPass in terms of, of Wi-Fi connectivity. So that's, that's very important to us, and that is a different business model. The, and, and by the way, the, the business model that we have with Hewlett Packard is different than the one we have with Microsoft. And while we haven't spoken about the details of those business models, they are very different, uh, but they are mutually beneficial in both cases. Uh, and I say mutually, it's good for iPass, it's good for Microsoft and HP, and ultimately, and most importantly, it's good for the customers. Right, exactly. Do you see the, the kind of Wi-Fi service that you provide now on a massive scale 
as a source of disruption against, for example, the mobile industry. I know your predecessor, Evan Kaplan, had a, had a, what I felt was a, quite a compelling disruption story. Uh, I'm not as interested in disrupting the, um, the carrier footprint. I, I think it's very much a, a, a case of not either or, but and. We work, as I mentioned, very, very closely with the, uh, the carriers as, as partners. And it's, it's very much a, a, a cooperation. We, we think that, as, as I think you know, uh, Wi-Fi can play a very key role in helping the carriers offload cellular traffic as cellular becomes more and more saturated, which, which of course it will, no one denies that there is limited bandwidth there and that certainly usage is not slowing down. So Wi-Fi provides a very good outlet for, for that traffic. And that's mm -hmm. the way we see our role. I, I see um, also iPads becoming increasingly not Wi-Fi only, but Wi-Fi first. Our, our job is to make sure that our customers are connected. And if they can't connect through Wi-Fi, I very much want to make sure that I can connect them through cellular. And if for some reason they're out in the middle of the Congo and cellular isn't available, I'd like to believe that I can connect them through satellite at some point. So mm -hmm. we, we see a um, very much our, our mission and our goal to provide no excuses, unlimited connectivity anywhere in the world. And that's the- Very good. And, and for companies like yourselves, and well, managed uh, Wi-Fi aggregator, uh, service provider and so forth, what do you think, and there's not that many of them by the way, but what do you think are the, are the main challenges in, in making a dent in the, in the mobile universe right now? Well, you know, as, as, as you know better than anyone, um, Wi-Fi technology is not always the simplest technology. It's it's uh, it's uh, sometimes not reliable. It sometimes is is not pervasive. Sometimes the performance is not great. Uh, but that's where we come in. We come in with technology that helps smooth that out and give our customers a universal experience, regardless of where they are in the world. So it's um, it's like a lot of a lot of people say, well, what about free Wi-Fi? And so, well, what about free Linux? Uh, anyone can go out and, and use Linux for free, but a lot of people think it's a lot easier to go to Red Hat or others where they can manage that Linux experience for you. And we see Wi-Fi is very much the same way. We provide uh, what we believe, and I think what our customers would attest to, a very valuable Wi-Fi service through the software that, that we provide. Very good. And I do want you to comment on IoT because you have been mentioning that. Mentioning that, And of course, right now, there's a, a lot of buzz and interest uh, in the mobile industry and elsewhere on IoT. Do you believe that IoT will be a significant source of revenue for iPass going forward? We haven't, we haven't done, we haven't done um, any kind of really detailed business modeling yet, but I do believe that the I IoT offers a, a tremendous opportunity, not only for iPass, but certainly for the entire industry at, at a whole. I mean, we, we've, we've said publicly that we believe that the economic impact of the IoT will be greater than the internet in itself. There's just so many, there's hardly a element of our lives that we can imagine that can't be touched by the IoT and by the incredible technology advances that are being made. Now, our role in this as we see is not so much trying to guess who the winners will, will be in IOT, what devices or what business models. Our, our goal is very simply to say that, hey, when these devices want to connect, want to be able to connect to share data with the people who want that data, that we'll be there to provide a network that allows them to do that wherever they are in the world. So we, we take a, I think a very modest role in being, um, being more than happy to play some small part in, in the growth of the IoT. Very good, Gary, Thank, thanks for all of that. One last question for you. If you could have anything you wanted in the Wi-Fi world, change any particular one thing, what would that be? <laughs> I, well, I would, I, would, uh, I would like $100 million worth of revenue right now, that's what I would like. <laughs> Very good, me too. <laughs> Yeah, okay. But I'm <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Thanks for coming on the show. And I should say, Gary Griffith is going to be uh, speaking at Wi-Fi Now, the conference in Amsterdam, and we're delighted to have you, and we're looking forward to seeing you there. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it, and I, and I appreciate you inviting me to attend. Thanks, Thanks a lot. So much.
See you next time. Yeah, see you. All right, everybody, on to our next guest. Now, venue Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi calling, and Wi-Fi offload, they're, they are all ways for carriers to monetize Wi-Fi and perhaps the leading vendor, ex vendor expert in this area right now is Aptilo Networks of Sweden. And we're delighted to have on the show Aptilo's CEO, Paul Mickelson. Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you, Klaus. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Are you coming to us live from Stockholm? Sorry, say again. Are you coming to us live from Stockholm? From Stockholm, yeah, I'm live from Stockholm now, definitely. Okay, good. Paul, uh, for the viewers, our viewers were not familiar with Aptilo, uh, and for somebody watching a Wi-Fi program, you would not be able to understand why that would be the case, but still, can you give us the two minute uh, introduction to what Aptilo is working with? Sure, uh, a pleasure. Uh, Aptila Networks, we are a software company as well, and uh, we are headquartered out of Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, we have been around since beginning of 2000, 2001, so we are into our 15 year of operation. A uh, long time before any Wi-Fi in Centrino you know, and building Wi-Fi was a, a standard thing to, to have. Uh, not even the laptops had Wi-Fi built in and back uh, on those days. And what we do is that we are providing a service management platform. Uh, I think the easiest way uh, to explain it is that it is an equivalent of a lot of the functionality that you normally find into a, a core network for an operator that is running a, a 2D, 3D, or LD network where you have capabilities or features and functions like uh, AAA functionalities, databases, you have policy, PCRF components. Uh, you have billing components, uh, you have portal and captive portal, onboarding portals, uh, you have statistics and analytics, and uh, we have put that together and packaged that to say pre-integrated, very high capacity uh, platform that is suitable for an operator to put in place when they are going to deploy a, a Wi-Fi network or a Wi-Fi calling service for, for that matter. And, and Paul, just uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the latest figure that I saw, was it something like 90 service providers, clients around the world? Is that about right or has it grown since I read that last? It's actually grown a little bit since you saw that figure. <laughs> uh, I think we are a little bit above 100, uh, plus 100 today, and uh, we have them in some 70, 75 countries around the world. So uh, we are quite... Uh, spread around so we are operating out of the stockholm head office or headquarter but we also have presence in the us in asia and down in uh, dubai and middle east to, to cover those parts of the world all right paul so tell us a little bit about what's driving the current interest in carrier wi-fi i mentioned wi-fi calling uh, there's always uh, the offload story that's still alive what do you think are, is the incentive for carriers to to invest in wi-fi now I think actually that uh, the main reason that we see a lot of operators investing in, in Wi-Fi and carry Wi-Fi is uh, the need of staying relevant in the market. And what I mean with that is that what we have seen and, and what we also see into the figures and the projection is that the majority of all the, the data traffic is already going over Wi-Fi network already today. I'm sure most of you that have been into the Wi-Fi business have seen figures like 70-80% of all the data traffic is already onboarded over Wi-Fi. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's not so hard to, to understand if we just think a little bit about where are you when you are a high consumer? Are you either in the office or you're at home or you are some uh, half station in, in a place between those, those places? Could be a hotel, could be an airport and so on. So you're see me detached so to say and you're not totally mobile in your car which means that wi-fi is a technology that is fitting those purposes very well so so the figure 70 to 80 percent is already a fact today and and i think um, that if we then see the projection yesterday a few years going ahead uh, a lot of uh, uh, the projections indicate that that figure can grow up to 85 90 percent if and if we stop there a little bit and think about it that the day when kind of 90% of your data goes through a network that is not a, a cellular, traditional cellular network, 
uh, with that I mean a free DOLD network. Uh, obviously, a lot of end users are going to ask themselves the question, uh, what am I paying for? Uh, am I going to continue to pay my 49 or 39 or 59 or 69 dollars for this service when I'm only using that uh, service for, for maybe so, so low as 10% of, of my usage? Uh, so that I think is the kind of the starting point for a lot of the operators, how to stay relevant and, and how to get back on, on that. And to address that, uh, I think you, you mentioned offloading. Definitely we see offloading as a mean for using Wi-Fi in more developed countries where you have a high uh, need of, of data capacity. Uh, you also see Wi-Fi as a very suitable technology to start building a... Uh, a, a true uh, mobile network infrastructure in those countries where you maybe not have a LTE license or LTE network yet. Maybe you are still kind of in the beginning of the, uh, to roll out your 3D network. So you can have a very poor kind of old uh, two and a half G network. Mm -hmm. And there we can see it. And you can find those pockets uh, in the market in Africa in Latin America and other places and so on in the more develop developing countries. So there you see Wi-Fi coming into play more as maybe the first technology that really can cope with that kind of data capacity that you, that you need for having video and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, you mentioned yourself Wi-Fi calling, which is around the corner and just yes, started to take off. We all know that there's a few operators already out there. I think you talked about T-Mobile before and mm -hmm. announcement from Sprint and from EE and so on. In, in, and we see a lot of... of uh, happening in in us in in the western europe around wi-fi calling so obviously wi-fi call and driven very much from an indoor perspective i mean the the uh, the fact that we have a, a a problem or poor kind of coverage indoor today uh wi-fi calling comes very handy into that because it's really kind of addressing what the small cell is is all about uh, mm -hmm. to get uh, into the indoor environment where you have a a, a problem with uh, to have a coverage today. Uh, and then I think there is a fourth driver actually of, of carrier Wi-Fi, and that's also venue Wi-Fi, because a lot of the operators that have had a, a very good Wi-Fi network for many years, they are used to do uh, agreements with hotels, shopping malls, and other places, coffee shops, and so on. And there is more and more a tendency uh, among those guys, the venue owners, that they are asking now for, okay, it's great that we have coverage and, and connectivity, but uh, what is in it for me? I mean, what can I get back from, from, from that? Can I get statistics, analytics about who is using the network? Can I use this network uh, to get closer to my end customer, to the visitor in that shopping mall? Can I use it for commercial purposes and to highlight different offerings and so on? So there is a much more kind of a two-way dialogue between the venue owner and the carrier going forward and those kind of demands and those kind of needs it's both a challenge for the operator but also a great opportunity so i think yeah. there's different things there so, yeah, absolutely and let me just ask you a little bit about the venue wi-fi because i think this is a super super uh big opportunity for many service providers out there but there's also a challenge in addressing it because it's so such a different model than renting a site and putting in uh equipment right because as you said there's the needs of the venue that have to be addressed what's in it for me so what do you think is the right way for carriers to approach that market because it's a different setup right than, than what they're used to it, it it is and 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 definitely it's much more of a, a business proposition and the corporation play uh, that we see in front of us uh, mm -hmm. i mean the traditional way of, of building coverage when you need to to rent a place or you need to rent the space on on the top of the roof, on the top of the church, to be able to put up your antennas. Uh, this is a total other play. This is much more a business to business kind of discussion where you need to find a, a good kind of a value proposition from an operator point of view towards the enterprise or towards the, the venue, the venue owner. So, mm -hmm. so that is a challenge and uh, it remains to be seen uh, uh, which operators is going to be successful or not. I mean, there is a reason that a lot of the Wi-Fi today is taken care of by the system integrator and they provide service directly to the venue owners instead of having an operator uh, involved in, in that process. 
But I think that if you play it in a good way, if you think through your business models and you have a good proposition to go back to the venue owner, the operator has all the opportunities to, to do much better going forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and do you see some movement on that front? Are you seeing some operators that are getting those things right as far as venue Wi-Fi is, is concerned? De definitely. I, I think that, I mean, Venue Wi-Fi, in, in, from one aspect, a lot of operators have done venue Wi-Fi since they started with Wi-Fi because they have done those kind of agreements with the venue places, uh, hospitality or airports and so on. So, so from one perspective, uh, they already kind of into the venue Wi-Fi. But if we talked about the kind of the next generation venue Wi-Fi where you have a good value proposition, you see a lot of movements and there is a lot of operators. I mean, I think we have discussion with maybe... Um, 10, 15, 20 of the existing customers, operators that we have that is looking into how they can improve that offering and how they can package it in a better way to, to be more attractive towards the, the venue owners. Very good. I, and I also do want to ask you about offload because I think of anybody in the Wi-Fi industry uh, among vendors, I would say that Aptilo has been championing the, the, the Wi-Fi offload story a lot. And and I have also been over the years championing it. Uh, and we are seeing, uh, we have seen cases, we are seeing cases. What's your view on it? Uh, is the offload story, or maybe a better word is convergence. Is that story growing in importance? Are we seeing growth there? I mean, definitely. And, and, and I think, I mean, partly we actually really, uh, we already answered that question when we talked about staying relevant and, mm -hmm. and, and that is a, an issue that is on the table and is an issue getting hotter and hotter every day. And uh, if, if the, 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 the figures are correct that we are heading towards a situation where 90 plus percent of the traffic goes through Wi-Fi, uh, I mean, then it is a, a real threat against a lot of the operators. So to stay relevant, to regain relevance, that, that's very important. And also on top of that, I think that the indoor coverage issue is something also that is fueling uh, the carrier Wi-Fi and the Wi-Fi among the, the, the operators even mm -hmm. further because uh, going back four or five years, uh, all the answers to that question was small cell. Uh, if we look at what have happened so far, I think there is a lot of disappointment in the market uh, within the, the small cell part. And, and, and one, one component or one reason for that, I, I think, is exactly the same thing when, as we talked about venue Wi-Fi. It is about the business modeling because suddenly to be able to succeed with small cell, you need to get access to the venues and to be inside some and a house and to start to deploy things there you need to get an agreement with that venue owner or that place owner and and that is another kind of challenge that the operator is not used to and and i think that has been one of the challenges that holding back the the small cell deployments and i see wi-fi more being a part of the small cell kind of uh, a package so small cell for me is a an indoor coverage with both Wi-Fi and other relevant technology like the 3D LTE or 5G or whatever we talk about. So it's, a, it's, it's truly going in the direction of the heterogeneous network where you're using the radio technology that makes most sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and, and my last question to you is about cable operators. Actually, I was just visiting one of the big cable operators here in the Netherlands a couple of days ago and they're, they're super innovative and in fact, super aggressive on what they want to do with Wi-Fi. They have street hotspots, uh, home spots, and so on and so forth. What And we see it, of course, a lot in the United States with the big cable operators. How do you see the role of the cable operators in Wi-Fi going forward, Paul? Well, I, I think they have a very important role to play. And they are, I mean, we see in certain markets where the cable operators are very, very active. Uh, I would say that in, in the US market, for example, maybe it's one of the more active markets, I mean, or less all of the, the, the cable or MSO operators have been announcing or have started to deploy uh, Wi-Fi and very, very uh, aggressive. So uh, we can also see pockets so in Europe where the cable operators are very active uh, within the Benelux country, so to say. I think you are living in one of the markets, uh, mm -hmm. so you for sure know that. And, uh, and, and we see a lot of aggressivity among the, the cable operators within Wi-Fi, within the Wi-Fi area. And I think 
it's it's making perfect sense because they have a great asset with with the backbone with the fiber the, the the cables that they can utilize for that so they have that advantage uh, so it's very wise at the same time uh, cable operators have seen a lot of of competition from the mobile operators by uh, introducing the over-the-top services so there is a lot of traditional kind of uh, cable services like uh, videos and, and, and TV and so on that today can be consumed on the cellular network with over-the-top services and, and obviously they need to, to address that kind of competition and by going Wi-Fi or going mobile or semi mobile they are addressing that and taking up the fight with the with the mobile operators mm -hmm. uh, so so that makes perfect sense and um, Yet another kind of option they have or an opportunity they have is that if they do Wi-Fi and then on top of that uh, get a MVNO agreement in place uh, for uh, covering uh, outside Wi-Fi area and then deploy a Wi-Fi first approach, I think the cable operators also have a great opportunity here going forward to actually take up the fight also on voice and, and traditional voice services. So with some kind of smart moves there and and with some agreements uh, and mvno agreements in place i think a lot of the cable operators have a, a very good opportunity to take up the fight with the with the big guys uh, the cellular guys or the mobile operator guys mm -hmm. so so that's a, a definitely a worthwhile for them to go for uh, mm -hmm. and on top of that uh, they don't only have to compete they can also cooperate because as i said they sit on that asset uh, on that backbone and uh, we also see a lot of cable operators uh, approaching the market more openly and, and and have a wholesale approach so they can actually sell capacity to the the mobile operators the mnos uh, so so that is yet another opportunity or business opportunity for them and, and then kind of lastly uh, i think also that they have also a good opportunity to actually grab that venue Wi-Fi and enterprise market because mm -hmm. they normally already have a relation with a lot of the, the venue owners and the, and the enterprise uh, uh, companies because mm -hmm. they're providing uh, internet access already to them. And for them to add on a, a managed service, kind of a cloud-based uh, Wi-Fi service or bring your own device service and so on, make perfect sense. Uh, mm -hmm. So. There is a lot of different uh, opportunities and segments that the cable operator can uh, can address, and and uh, for sure they will go for that. Paul Mickelson, CEO of Aptilo Networks, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your insights. And by the way, we're also delighted that Aptilo is joining us for Wi-Fi Now, the conference in Amsterdam. By the way, in Amsterdam, we are also going to hear from a number of great cable and converged uh, mobile Wi-Fi. Uh, and cable operators from this region. They're doing really exciting stuff, so uh, watch out for that. Uh, Paul, thank you for coming and come back and uh, another time and tell us more. It's been really good, thanks. Thank you, Klaus. Thanks a lot and see you in Amsterdam. See you there. See you. All right, everybody, that was it for today's show. All that remains for me to say is to tell you what's coming up on next week's show. And we've got some really good stuff because we've got Venian, they're an exciting startup. Venian is creating the internet of moving things. If you don't know them, your chance is next week uh, during this show. And uh, they are connecting moving vehicles and serving up public Wi-Fi at the same time. And uh, it's a really promising company. Also, Smith Micro will be here. They're right now launching a new device client uh, type of technology for mobile Wi-Fi convergence services. And they're working with U.S. cable giant Comcast Xfinity. We're going to talk uh, all about that next week. Same place, uh, same time. I want to thank all my guests, uh, of course, Paul Mickelson and also uh, Gary Griffiths, uh, Griffiths sorry, of iPass. And next week, I'll be back in my regular studio. Today, I want to thank F-Secure uh, Holland for letting me borrow their meeting room for this show. I'll see you next week, same place, same time. Wi-Fi Now is a production of RCR TV News. To suggest a show topic or to learn more about Wi-Fi Now events, you can reach Klaus Heading at klaus at headingconsulting.com. To find out more about Wi-Fi Now and all things wireless, visit rcrwireless.com.